Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for being with us this afternoon. And, and I really wish that uh, it would have worked out for me to be there with you in person. And I'm sorry it didn't, but that'll happen. Um, you know, knock on wood, that'll happen someday soon. I hope in the next several months we can get over this pandemic and move forward and get a little bit back to normal and I can get up there to see y'all. Um, Father Jim asked me to talk about the book of Revelation, the Antichrist, and the mark of the beast. Apparently there have been some, some uh, questions a couple of people have raised up there and wanting answers. So that's, that's what I'm going to talk about. But before I do, I have to say one of those things is not like the others. And, and I'll explain that as, as we go along. I'm going to take about an hour and a half of teaching. I'm going to stop intermittently for questions, conversation, uh, anything you might have to say or ask or any input. And um, I think in my head, I think I'm, I've got three segments. So the first segment is... I need to say a word about a word in the book of Revelation. I'm, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the book of Revelation. And then I'm going to talk specifically about the mark of the beast and then specifically about the Antichrist. But the first thing I need to say about the book of Revelation, and this is, may come as a shock to uh, some of you, is the book of Revelation is not about the end times. It's not a book on eschatology any more than Hebrews or Romans or 1 Corinthians is a book on eschatology. All those books have something to say about eschatology, about the study of end things, but none of them are about that. Neither is the book of Revelation about that. And I'm going to suggest to you um, what the book of Revelation is about in a few minutes. However, before I do, I want to read you seven verses taken from the book of Revelation. That will, I hope, set the time frame for that book. Because so many people read the book or preach on the book and say it's about the future. It's about the 21st century. It's about something coming around the corner. It's about, you know, our future. And, and I would argue that it absolutely is not a book about the future. It's a book about things that happened in the first century. It uses what's called apocalyptic language, the same kind of language that the Old Testament prophets use. It is a kind of New Testament equivalent to the Old Testament prophets, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. So listen to these seven verses, and this is the first thing you might want to jot down. The very first verse of the book, Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Now, that word soon wasn't written to readers in the 21st century. You know, I, I grew up in a tradition that one of the key words, one of the key phrases is Jesus is coming soon. Um, this wasn't written to you. It wasn't written to people living in 2020. It was written to people living in the first century. It was their soon, not our soon. This is a revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. Next verse, chapter 2, verse 16. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon. 
and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Chapter three, verse 11. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Chapter 22, verse six. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. Chapter 22, verse seven. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Chapter 22, verse 12. Behold, I am coming soon. Chapter 22, verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. Seven times there's a mention of the soonness of things that were about to happen, including the coming of Lord, not the second coming, not, not the final coming, but, but God coming, the Jesus showing up in judgment, showing up uh, in, in the fulfillment of prophecy. So, those of us like me that grew up in a tradition that said this is all about the rapture and the tribulation and the end times in our future, uh, I, I would suggest that we've got that wrong, that we've, we've been approaching it from a wrong angle. Okay, having, having said that, let's talk for a minute um, about meta, the meta story. I have a friend who is an artist. In fact, he, he did the cover for my, for my new book. He's a great artist. Um, and I did a little road trip with him last week to introduce him to some historic sites in Texas where some, you know, the Alamo and some other battles. And uh, he took a photo somewhere in our trip. And he's, he is artistically working with that, making a painting. And he, he wrote me and asked, where did I take this? Where was it? I said, I, I don't know, but you can look at the metadata on your phone. Modern, you know, iPhones and Androids, you take a picture and the data is in there where you took the picture because it's all connected with, with uh, you know, maps. That's called metadata, the data behind what you see the metadata that, that gives the thing its structure and its, its focus. So let me talk to you about the metadata of the Bible. And I'm talking about of the entire Bible from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation. You know, you have, you have DNA. We all have DNA. Um, I took, I did my DNA test on um, Ancestry.com and it, it came back that I was one half of 1% black. And uh, I have a, a dear pastor friend up in Chicago who is um, black and pastor is a black congregation. I wrote him and said, no one. I'm a half percent black. And he wrote me back and said, how does it feel to be a brother? So, so um, I'm, I'm proud of my black heritage now. I found that out through doing DNA because DNA tells your whole story. It's the metadata of you. And they can take DNA from your cheek or from hair or from your toenail any part of your body, they can take a DNA sample and it tells the whole story of your body. It tells your ancestry. It tells what you're allergic to, what diseases you're prone to, what you're immune to. Um, it's, it's amazing. If you've never done it, I, I suggest you do it. It tells your hair color, your eye color, all your data, your metadata is contained in your various cells. What I'm going to share with you right now, I believe, is the metadata or the DNA of the Bible. I honestly think if you would commit these five things to memory, it would transform your reading and your study of the scriptures. So, in the ancient world, 
the world of the Bible, and even before that, there is something called the suzerain vassal covenant. Suzerain means the big king. Vassal means the, the sub-king, the little king, the one under the big king's authority. So it goes something like this. Imagine that, that the king of a, of a great country, a strong, powerful world empire, you know, Babylon or Assyria or Rome, uh, the king of a great empire comes into a smaller kingdom and overtakes it. He says, this is mine now. You're under me now. You're, you're under my authority now. And he makes a covenant with the people. That covenant has a classic structure that is found throughout the ancient world, throughout the ancient Near East and Middle East. Um, it's found in Babylonian covenants, in Assyrian covenants, in uh, all throughout the Bible. And I'm going to show you the, the five points of that structure. Now, you, you may be thinking, wait a minute, I logged on here to watch about the book of Revelation. This is the key, I promise you. So here's, here's how that covenant works, five points. The first point, and, and I'm writing it on my whiteboard, okay? The first point is transcendence. Transcendence, it means above and beyond. And here's what the first point says. I'm the great king. I'm in charge. I make the rules. We're not negotiating here. This is not a contract. I'm the one that tells you how the cow eats the cabbage. You can take it or leave it, but I'm the one in charge. And so the great king in, in the first part of that document, he will say, you know, I am King, king Ken of Assyria, and I am the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords, and there is none other above me, and, and make these bold, boastful statements about himself. But he establishes who is in charge. Transcendence asks the question, who is in charge? That's the first part of covenant. The second part is called hierarchy. Because that king is not going to stay in that little country he's just overtaken. He's going back to his palace, to his harems, to his hanging gardens, to his luxury baths. He's going back to the seat of his power. But... He is going to leave representation. He's going to leave someone there who speaks for him, who speaks on his behalf, who represents him. Hierarchy. And so the second part of a covenant document is, I, the great king, am going home, but young Prince Charlie here is going to represent me. The question that asks is, who enforces the rules. The first question is, who makes the rules? Transcendence. The second question is, who enforces the rules? Hierarchy. The third part of a covenant is called ethics. And it asks the question, what are the rules? In that part of the covenant, everything is listed that is expected from the people. I demand that you offer incense to me once a year and worship me as God. And 50% of everything you make is given in taxes. You don't get to negotiate. The king is setting the rules. He's got his hierarchy there to enforce the rules, but the king tells you what's expected. That's the third part of covenant, ethics. The fourth part of the covenant is called sanctions. It asks the question, what are the consequences of keeping or breaking the rules? And that part of the covenant will say things like, 
If you pay your taxes and worship me once a year, I'll send in my armies and they will build roads for you and they will protect you from invading enemies and you will prosper and grow your crops and raise your families and all will be good and peaceful. If you don't do all these things I have commanded you, I'm going to send my armies in and they're going to plow up your crops and salt your fields and you know, rape your wives and sell your children as slaves and burn down your houses and, and wipe you out. The biblical term for this is blessings and curses. But it's really the consequences of keeping or not keeping the rules. So are you tracking along with me so far? Number one, transcendence. Who makes the rules? Who's in charge? Number two, hierarchy. Who represents the one in charge? Who enforces the rules? Number three, ethics. What are the rules? What, what is this covenant all about? Number four, sanctions, consequences. What happens if we keep the rules or if we break the rules? What are the blessings and curses? And last but not least, continuity. Continuity. That document always ends by saying here's how the next generation continues this covenant here's how your children recut the covenant when they grow up here's how you know the prince succeeds the king upon his death there there are there are points of succession there are points of continuity there's how it asks the question how does this covenant continue into the future okay transcendence hierarchy ethics sanctions continuity i would argue that is the dna of scripture the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation is God's is the story of God's relationship with us and with humanity. And relationship with God is covenantal. And he is the Lord of all. He is the great king of all kings. He's the transcendent one. And so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible are this structure. The Ten Commandments are this structure two times over. Five points of covenant twice. Possibly every prophetic book, but for sure most of the prophetic books in the Old Testament follow this model precisely. The Lord the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah or whoever. And it's almost always a prophetic word against, not the people, but against the leadership of the people, against the kings, the nobles, uh, the wealthy, or the, the clergy, the priests. It's almost always a prophetic word against the hierarchy. And those prophets say, the Lord spoke to me, and I've got a word for you, kings or priests or wealthy. Here's what the Lord required of you. And the prophets will list out the law. But you didn't do it. You didn't keep it. You've been bad priests or you've been bad rulers. And so all these horrible things are about to come crashing down on your head. Sanctions. But the prophets always end with hope. But there will be a remnant that will be restored. But if you repent, I will take away all these curses. There's always the hope of continuity. The book of Matthew, based on this structure. Uh, the book of Romans, based on this structure. And, and, and if you learn it, if you, get, if you get this into your heart, if you get these five points into your heart and mind, all of a sudden you will see it everywhere as you're studying the scriptures. 
All that to say, this same five points, I believe, is the metadata for the book of Revelation. And once you see these five points and lay it over the book of Revelation, it all comes together and it makes sense. And it doesn't look like some scattered, wild, you know, mushroom trip that some prophet had. It, it suddenly makes sense. So I'm going to take about three or four minutes before we go and lay this model over the book of Revelation and take any comments or questions you, uh, you may have. Unmute yourself if you have a question and let's talk. And if there are no questions, we'll move on, but I welcome your input. I, yeah, just a quick comment, and that's and that's interesting. Uh, you know what you say about covenant, because I actually remember, you know, as a kid growing up, my grandparents would actually refer to the Old Testament as the Old Covenant mm -hmm. very often, and and the same thing with the New Testament, they would refer to it as the New Covenant. And, and I don't know. Sometimes it just makes me think maybe they had a better understanding of what covenant was than we do now. Yeah. yeah. So, so just that comment, not really a question. Anybody else? Nope. Keep going. Okay. Okay. So what I'm going to suggest is the book of Revelation, just, just like the Old Testament prophets were prophetic writings, covenant, they were, if you will, covenantal lawsuits against the leadership of Israel. Um, the, the prophets could be seen, I suppose, as prosecuting attorneys. In that same way, the book of Revelation is a covenant document, a covenant lawsuit against the leadership of Israel in the time of the apostles. The first century, the generation after the death of Jesus. And pretty much everything in it is about the first century. I'm not saying it doesn't speak to the end at all, it does. But it's about things going on in the first century. So what happened in the first century? Jesus dies, let's, let's give it a day, AD 30, Jesus dies. Before he dies, in Matthew 24, when he's speaking uh, what's called the Olivet Discourse, which is where the phrase, by the way, the Great Tribulation comes from, he says, you know, he talks about stars falling from the sky, the gospel going to all the world, nation against nation. You'll hear of wars, rumors of wars, uh, all of these things. And then he says, all of this will happen in this generation. This generation shall not pass away until all of these things have happened. So Jesus dies in about AD 30, 40 years later, Jerusalem is destroyed. The old covenant ceases to exist. The temple is gone. The priesthood is gone. The sacrifices are gone. The national structure is gone. It was in their minds, the end of the world, the end of their world. The book of Revelation is written to Christians. And more particularly to Christian leadership. And even more particularly to seven Christian leaders. 
seven pastors, seven bishops in Asia Minor about things which must soon take place in their lives. And the book of Revelation is a book of transition from the old covenant to the new. The dying, the falling apart, the death of the old covenant, the emergence, the birth, the growth, the blossoming of the new covenant. I just reminded myself of a verse, Hebrews. Chapter eight, verse 13, Hebrews eight thirteen. In speaking, excuse me, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. This is the writer of Hebrews talking about the old covenant, the Aaronic priesthood, the sacrifices in the temple, the law, and so on. God is bringing forth a new covenant, and this old one is obsolete and growing old and ready to disappear, ready to vanish away. Well, in AD 70, it disappeared. It vanished away. It came to an end, and the new covenant blossom, the church, the gospel. So the book of Revelation is about that. It's about the demise of the old covenant and the old covenant structures and the blossoming of the new covenant. And it's written absolutely precisely in that five point structure. So let's look at that for a minute. Chapter one, I'm writing on my whiteboard again. Chapter one is transcendence. What does the question that transcendence asks? Who makes the rules? Chapter one, John is in exile on the Isle of Patmos. It's, it's a little island off the coast of Asia Minor. He's stuck there, alone, maybe, maybe having a little bit of a pity party even. John was an apostle. His home base was Ephesus. The churches around Ephesus included Smyrna, Laodicea, um, the seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation. So, so if you can think of it like this, John is an archbishop. He's the apostle. But he's a, let's say he's an archbishop and he has these seven bishops under his authority. And here John is on the Isle of Patmos, all alone. And, and let's say it's Sunday morning. Let's say it's the Lord's day because that's what chapter one says. And John looks at his, at his Timex and says, oh my goodness, it's, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. They're, they're coming to church in Ephesus. They're gathering to do mass in Ephesus. In Smyrna, in these other cities, they're gathering to worship. And here I am stuck on this island. And suddenly Jesus shows up. He hears the sound of the rushing of many waters. And he turns around to look. And he sees Jesus. But this is not Jesus gentle, meek, and mild. This is not Jesus, you know, 33 years old with brown hair and a beard. This is Jesus, but he looks like 
the vision of God described in Ezekiel and in Isaiah. Flaming, you know, white hair, clothes whiter than snow, flaming eyes, uh, he, 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 from, from the waist down, the appearance of fire. This, in other words, transcendent being. And Jesus says, I am another transcendent statement, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, another transcendent statement, I encapsulize everything. I hold the keys to death in the grave. Chapter one is establishing who's in charge. Chapter one is the transcendent section of this covenant document. Chapters two and three, we call them the letters to the seven churches. But more precisely, it is the letters to the angels or the messengers. I would say the bishops, the leadership of the seven churches. And some of them, there are words of correction. And some of them, there are words of praise. But this document is directed to the leadership of this new covenant people. Are you with me so far? Chapters two and three, hierarchy. Chapter one, transcendence. Chapters two and three, hierarchy. Who is called to enforce this new covenant? Chapters four and five, are the ethics section. What are the rules? And if you read chapters four or five, John, you know, John's, he's on the Isle of Patmos. He's kind of bummed out that he can't be there worshiping with the people. He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And in chapter four, this angel shows up and says, well, this voice comes out of heaven saying, come up here. And, and, it's, and, and by the way, the book of Revelation also is about liturgy. And we get some of the structure of our liturgy straight from the book of Revelation. And we're at the part now where the priest says, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. The voice from heaven says, John, come up here. You're joining. And then we say, we join with you know, all the hosts of heaven who forever sing, holy, holy, holy. All of that's taken straight out of the book of Revelation. But this is John being invited into the heavenly realm. And when he gets there, what he sees is a courtroom or a throne room. And sitting on the throne is the lamb. And there's a document. There's a document that has seven seals. A, an ancient world document sealed with seven seals meant there were seven different witnesses who you know, put their seal on the document. That is a classic model of an ancient covenant or a last will and testament. And at the reading of that will, the seals are broken. At the establishing of that covenant, the seals are broken and the document is read. So there's this document, there's this seven seal document. And the question is, who's worthy? Who is worthy to open this document? And that's where the song comes from. Thou art worthy. The lamb who sits on the throne is worthy. Who is worthy to establish a new covenant? Christ. The lamb who sits on the throne, the lamb who is God, the lamb slain from the foundations of the world establishes this new covenant. The old covenant is dying. It's falling away. It's about to collapse. This new covenant is being unsealed. And as the new covenant blossoms forth, as the ethics of the new covenant are opened, there is poured out all these negative sanctions upon the old covenant leadership that had rejected 
Christ. Remember they said, don't say he's king of the Jews, say he claims to be king of the Jews. And the response was, what is written is written. They said, we have no king but Caesar. Let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. They jumped in bed. The leadership of Israel, both the political and spiritual leadership, jumped in bed with Rome. And then Rome turned and devoured Israel. And in AD 70, Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. The old covenant came to an end. That's what the book of Revelation is about. So where were we? Sanctions, hierarchy, or rather transcendence, Jesus is Lord. Hierarchy, letters to the seven bishops, angels, messengers of the seven churches. Throne room scene, covenant document, open ethics. Now we come to sanctions. And the bulk of the book of Revelation is about the sanctions. It's chapter six through about chapter 19. And that's where all the crazy, scary stuff happens. You know, the, the creatures coming out of the ground and the, the, the mark of the beast and the, the, uh, the seven-headed dragon coming up out of the sea and all that crazy stuff, except none of it's crazy. It's all language from the Old Testament prophets that they would use against Egypt or against Assyria, or against Babylon, that suddenly that same language is being used against Old Covenant Israel. Parenthetical moment. I may have done this before at your church, I don't remember, but it's an illustration I use. When I say, remember the Alamo, Probably people in Kentucky realize, uh, yeah, there was, a, there was a battle there. Something happened. This is San Antonio. I went there on vacation. Davy Crockett died there. And that's pretty much it. But when you're raised in Texas, and from the fourth grade forward, you are schooled in Texas history. Remember the Alamo has a whole ton of metadata behind it. There was a battle three months before that in Gonzales, Texas, where the Mexicans came and wanted a cannon and the Texans held up a flag that said, come and take it. And that started things rolling. And then there was the Battle of the Alamo and Davy Crockett and Jim Bowie and William B. Travis were there and 182 men died. It was a 13 day siege. There were 3000 Mexicans, a thousand Mexicans died. They were defeated, but it gave Sam, it gave Sam Houston time to build his army and just six weeks later on the fields of San Jacinto near Houston, Texas, Sam Houston confronted Santa Ana and beat him and captured him. And in an 18 minute battle won independence from Mexico. <laughs> All of that comes to mind for a Texan when someone says, remember the Alamo. When someone would use a phrase like the abomination of desolation, it just goes over our head. It means nothing to us. But to a first century Jew, there was a whole story behind it. When someone uses a phrase about a plague of frogs being poured out as Revelation does, we modern readers think, huh, bunch of frogs. That'd be a bummer. Oh my gosh, he's referencing what happened in Egypt with the plagues that Moses brought upon the land. 
all of the data, all of the story. These are, these are just handles that, that the author uses that tells a whole story in the mind of the reader because they're familiar with the data. Do you understand what I'm saying? So chapters 6 through 19 uses all this prophetic language, this apocalyptic language that to us today maybe is confusing, but to a first century leader or reader made all the sense in the world. Chapter 6 through 19 is about the downfall of Jerusalem, the priesthood, the political structures. As the new covenant goes forward, here's all the bad things happening to the old covenant way. And so chapter 6 through 19 is the sanctions part. But there's continuity. And the last part of the book of Revelation, chapters 20 through 22, is the continuity section. How does this thing continue into the future? And you have, I looked and behold, a city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride. We all know who the bride of Christ is. It's the church. This is not a picture of some literal city coming down out of the sky, you know, a hundred years from now, this is, John said, it is even now in the process of coming down in Greek. It is now coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride. This is a picture of the church, of the new covenant people that are, that are going to blossom and grow. And, and, and that goes on into eternity how the new covenant continues after the demise of the old. So, what's five points of covenant? Transcendence, hierarchy, ethics, sanctions, continuity. That is the five points of the book of Revelation. And once you see that, and that it is about the first century and not the 21st, stuff starts making sense. I'm going to pause there. Uh, questions or comments, and then we're going to go on and talk about one of those handle phrases in the book of Revelation. But comments or questions? So anybody want to take a real quick break to get a drink or anything of that nature, go ahead and do that. Father Ricky, are you saying something? Because if you are, you're on mute. No, I was I, I was discussing. Uh, Brenda was asking some questions oh, here, so that's why I'm, I'm unmuting now uh, to ask the question. Do you, uh, when you talk about coming soon, and it's uh, referring that back to first century, but it talks about Jesus coming soon. Is that? I mean, and he hasn't returned yet. So is is that totally out of context there or something? Yeah, I, I would say that that phrase coming soon, the, 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 the phrase coming at all, mm -hmm. coming with clouds of heaven is, uh, is apocalyptic language. It starts in the book of Daniel. And it, it, in Daniel, it references the ascension and it references judgment all throughout the Old Testament, the coming of the Lord, uh, the day of the Lord. It, we, we tend to peg it to the end times, to the final coming of the Lord. But Christ, in a multitude of ways, in a variety of times and, and fashions, he comes. And, and one of the comings of the Lord is him coming in judgment. And, and in Revelation, he says, I come, I'm coming soon and I have my reward with me. 
Um, it's him coming in judgment, coming in judgment against the, the corrupt leadership of the old covenant, coming in judgment with blessings for, for the new covenant. Um, it, it doesn't take away from the reality of the second coming, what we call the second coming, the final coming of the Lord. But that's not the point, I don't believe, of Re if you, we can read about that coming of the Lord, particularly in Paul's writings. But the, the revelation, I believe, is about the, the, the coming of the Lord in judgment against, uh, against Israel and the Old Covenant. Okay. All right. If a further question, too, uh, as we get into some of the, you, you get into some of the apocalyptic language and all that stuff and a lot of the things that, that some of the, uh, the teachers, the literalistic teachers kind of say, well, that's me, this is tanks, this is that, yada, yada, yada. Uh, obviously that, you know, they can be taken to the point of absurdity, which many of them do, but is, is it not also the case that you see, that you see throughout, throughout the Bible, the Bible has a kind of a watermark in it, of Jesus, right? So all throughout the Bible, you hear the story of Joseph, that's really a story, a prophetic story of Jesus, right? You hear the story of Abraham and, and Isaac, uh, the prophetic story of Jesus. Is it not also the case that in Revelation, with some of this, the, the things happening, when we talk of the spirit of Antichrist and all that, that don't we also, can't we also see instances of that, basically, uh, that the, that Jerusalem in, in uh, 70 AD is a prophetic foreshadowing of something that happens in the future. Uh, I mean, like we see a lot right now, 2020 is, a, a, I mean, the prophet's going wild, right? I mean, so, the, but, but, but there is a lot of things, that being said, some of them are, are way out there. On the other hand, some yeah, of them yeah. are, are making a lot of sense in some particular areas. But if you don't get down into the specific detail that this is this is what you know this some of them saying this is what uh revelation was saying uh, and it pertains to right now no not necessarily just right now but it that what we see now is a prophetic shadow after shadow of what happened before yeah yeah let me let me just fine-tune that a little bit uh, if i may the book of revelation i'm about to sneeze here <laughs> the book of Revelation is about the first century, but it has application mm -hmm. in any century, including our own time. Just like 1 Corinthians is about the church in Corinth, but we read it and go, oh, that's kind of exactly like stuff going on in our church. Okay. And we learn how to deal with it, how to respond to it, and so on. Right. So I, I wouldn't say, in fact, the, the, the Christian worldview does not allow for a cyclical history. It's a linear history. It's going somewhere. It has a, a teleos. It has an end point, a, a destination and a goal. And so it's not like history repeating itself or, oh, this all happened in the first century and it's going to happen again in the 21st century. No, it's that this all happened in the first century and there's a heck of a lot we can learn from it and apply to situations in the 21st century. And so um, there's no Roman Empire right now. There's no, um, well, I can't, it will take all day to get into all the, all the nuances, but, but, we, but, but we can look sometimes at, at the concept of world power doing ungodly things and how do we respond to that and how do we put our trust in God that he will deliver us out of that and so on and so forth so it's appli application as opposed to interpretation the interpretation is this is about the first century the application is oh it applies to the 21st century as well okay that makes sense mm -hmm. anybody else Go ahead. So the concept of covenant still continues today. Absolutely. We're, absolutely. So we're, we're in the so new we're, covenant. We're in the new covenant. So that still carries with it the idea of sanctions, 
the idea of blessings and curses yep. and yep. there and there will someday be a culmination correct yep. Yep. okay and 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 just to to speak to that a little bit um The question, the, the 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 sanctions question is, what are the consequences? Right, right. Of keeping or breaking the rules, it's not. <clears throat> it's not so much that God says, "Oh, you didn't keep the rule. I'm going to zap you with lightning from heaven." It's 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 God saying, "Hey, don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do don't do." It. Oh, you did it. Look right. what happened. It's right. not. It's not God actively smiting right. you. Right. Right. It's, well, what do you expect? You know how. Right. Exactly. Dr. Phil Clay, how's that working out for you? You know. Um, right. And, and God is always. I love the in the in the prayer of humble access. Whose property is always, always to, to have, have mercy. mercy. Right. God's heart is always to have mercy. Let's fix that. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. okay. Thanks. You know, Bishop, that, uh, if I may, that it brings back memories of our of our last gathering down in uh, down in uh, Denison. You know, when we talked about the wrath of God, exactly that has been so misinterpreted and misunderstood over time that often the wrath of God is something that's simply built into the fabric of creation. You know, and it's the, it, it it's the natural result of what you do not because God's standing up there shaking his finger and causing it to happen in the moment. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Anybody else? Yeah, I do have a small question. Um, I, I fully agree with you. I have for since we first met. A couple questions that I have, though, is in the book of Revelations, it talks about the angels holding back the winds and then be let it go. A third of the earth being, you know, burned. The uh, what was a wormwood coming down from the sky and poisoning one third of the earth's water supply, things like that. Yeah. Um, it's a great question. I'm going to give you a short, inadequate answer that, um, and I'm going to recommend a couple of books if you want to dig in farther. But uh, the, the short answer is the word earth in Greek is ge, G-E. And like our English word earth, it has multiple meanings. I can be at your house when you go out in your backyard and I can scoop up a handful of earth. I'm holding earth in my hand. Or another word we use is land. Deacon Clay, you got, you got some pretty land there. We're talking about a pasture. Or the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, the land of England. We're talking about geography, a place. Or in a general, broader way, the land, the earth. So you have to interpret it contextually. And I think it's an unfortunate translation that a lot of modern day English translations translate the word earth, a third of the earth, or a third of the people of the earth died, or all the tribes of the earth, all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. What are we talking about? Apache and you know Aztec? If, if I say tribe, and we're talking about American Old West, you think of the Navajo, the Comanche. But, but let's change the focus. If I talk about tribe, and we're talking biblical places and times, you go to the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin, the 12 tribes. I don't believe it says all the tribes of the earth will mourn. I believe it says all the tribes of the land will mourn. The land. What, what land? The land. What, what land? The, it's been called from the get-go, from the book of Genesis, the promised land. We still call it that. I'm going to take a tour to the promised land. 
for a Jew in the first century, the land meant Israel and the tribes meant the tribes of Israel. So I think it's an unfortunate translation when it says a third of the earth will be burned or a third of the people of the earth will die. We're talking about a first century thing where a third of the people of Israel, maybe, you know, there were over a hundred thousand. There were 1.1 million people killed in the siege of Jerusalem. Over a hundred thousand men were crucified on the roads of Jerusalem. Eyewitness, Josephus was an eyewitness who be, beheld this. So uh, it, we're talking about a third of the land, not a third of the earth. We've got to look at it in a contextual, in a context of Israel in the first century, uh, not a global thing. And, and the same with Matthew 24. It's not speaking about things on a global level at the end of time. It's talking about uh, the first century. If, if, if you see this happening and you're on the roof of your house, don't go down and pack a bag. Flee to the hills of Judea. He's not talking to people in Texas, telling them to flee to the hills of Judea. He's talking to people in the first, and by, and by the way, when's the last time you were sitting out on the roof of your house? No, he's talking to first century people in Israel about things going on in the first century in Israel. And so context is super important, Deacon Clay, um, and the context ought to be first century Israel, not 21st century whole earth. Does that make sense? No, oh, perfectly, perfectly. Good. Anyone else? Okay. Then um, we're going to, I have two final points to make. I'm turning in my Bible. Book of Revelation. Okay. Father Jim said that folk had asked a couple, wanted to ask me a couple of questions about the Antichrist and the mark of the beast. Everything I've said up until now is preparatory. It's just laying a foundation. Now, I'm going to answer those two questions and then I'll be done. Um, let's talk about, first of all, Antichrist, and then we'll talk about Mark of the Beast. It comes as a shock to people. Oh, and by the way, this book is not called Revelations, plural. It is singular, and it's important. That S makes a huge difference. I mean, it's the difference between wife and wives. Um, <laughs> girlfriend and girlfriends. It's not a book of revelations. It's not a book of a bunch of different revelations about things that are going to happen in the future. It is the revelation, singular, of Jesus Christ. It is the showing forth of Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. People are shocked oftentimes when they learn that the phrase, the word, the term antichrist is never used one single time in the book of Revelation. Not once. The Antichrist is not mentioned in the Revelation. Now what we've done is we've superimposed parts from other texts in the Bible and laid them on top and laid them on top, layer upon layer, and we've created something that actually isn't even referred to in the Bible. When I say Antichrist, most people think of 
a future world leader who sets himself up as deity almost, persecutes the people of God, and causes all hell to break loose in the earth. The thing is, that entity is not mentioned. What happens here is somebody takes a little bit of something that St. Paul is talking about and a little bit of something that St. John is talking about and a little bit of something from the Revelation and puts it together and builds something that actually doesn't exist in the scriptures. It's a very corny story but it bears repeat. It probably doesn't even bear repeating, but I'm going to repeat it. You're going to have to bear with me. Um, the person that opens the Bible to get a word from God. And the first is Judas hung himself and they close it and open it. Go and do thou likewise. That's not, that's not the way we read the Bible. We don't take a piece here and a piece there, and create something that's not really there. But that's what people have done with Antichrist. So there is no future one world leader, one government, you know, one world government leader that opposes all the things of God and sets himself up as a demigod. No. I'm going to read to you every single reference to Antichrist in the Bible. And it's not going to take long because it's all from John's epistles and there are only four verses. First John 2.18. Little children, it is the last hour. You know, earlier Paul and Peter and others talk about the last days. Not the last days of history, the last days of the old covenant. Well, now here's John. He's the only one that's left. He's an old man. The destruction of Jerusalem is right around the corner. And John writes, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. So first of all, Antichrist is not a future singular entity. John says it was a reality in the first century, and there were many of them. Well, what is this Antichrist then? Or who are these Antichrists? Are they, you know, world leader powers that oppress Christians? 1 John 2, 22. Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, this is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. Oh, wait, we're not talking about some... <laughs> My phone just looked up 1 John 2.22 for me. Um, <laughs> technology. We're not talking about some powerful world leader. We're talking about the one who denies the Father and the Son, the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. 1 John 4, 3. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is in the world already. And lastly, 2 John 1, 17, for many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the Antichrist. So basically what we're talking about, what John is talking about when he coins and uses that term Antichrist, he's talking about false prophets false teachers who deny that Jesus is God come in the flesh, the Messiah sent from God come in the flesh. 
Book of Revelation has nothing to say about the Antichrist. Neither does Paul. That's a John, a Johannian phrase about false prophets and false teachers. And as Father Ricky pointed out, that can be true in the 21st century. That can be true in the 18th century. But it was written, John wrote these epistles to Christians in the first century. We can apply it to now, but it's written about things going on in John's time. So that's my answer to the first question that I was asked to comment on. What about the Antichrist? That's what about the Antichrist. Before I talk about the mark of the beast, anybody have comments or questions about what we've just looked at? Yeah, I, I just point out that, uh, uh, that that sometimes I uh, I have some some difficulty because people tend to use the term the Antichrist. I had I just use the word Antichrist because to me it's more of a concept than it is a person. Exactly. You know, and uh, and so even even when I'm communicating with people, um, you know, I try to leave that word the off because it. Be, that, that starts to make it far too specific and become, yeah. you know, and, and yeah. ties into uh, uh, this nonsensical idea. You, you could use and. and I, I, would, I would suggest rather than, uh, I, I wouldn't label it a concept. I would call it, a, I would call it the spirit of Antichrist. Spirit. Yeah. And I think that okay. right now that we're experiencing a very strong spirit of Antichrist uh, in the world today. I think that uh, what's going on against the church today, there's there's a strong, strong spirit of Antichrist in in uh, uh, that that we see that's coming up against the church, there and is. and it's not unique to our day or our time, right? But you know, I'm, I'm yeah. going to get some water. I'll be right back. <clears throat> It looks like uh, Bishop Ken's back porch there that we're seeing through that window. And that, that that's one of the nicest back porches I've ever been on in my life, by the way. <laughs> if the last time we were there, that table back there was full of bourbon. It was. It was covered up with <laughs> bourbon, wasn't it? <laughs> Several bottles. <laughs> what are you talking about? Oh, we're just talking about your back porch there behind you. Oh, I wish you were here. I do, too. <laughs> and it's about 75 degrees today, too, so it's oh, perfect. Really shut up. Sitting out there. It's not, it's not that far away from that here. It's in the 60s. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Okay, are we ready to go to the next thing? Yep. Okay. Oh, Mark of the Beast. That's what we're talking about. And that's the final thing that, that we'll talk about today. See, here's what happens. The book of Revelation describes this character called the beast. Paul describes this character called the man of sin. John de describes these characters and this spirit of Antichrist. And what people do is they take that title, Antichrist, and lay it over on top of the beast. Oh, the beast is the Antichrist. Well, maybe an Antichrist, but not the Antichrist, and certainly not some 21st or 25th or future century entity. What happens in the book of Revelation is you have two beasts. The first beast comes up out of the sea. And he has 10 horns and seven heads. It's a dragon, basically a seven-headed dragon.
The beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words. It was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then there's a second beast, the beast in, in verse 11 of chapter 13, I saw another beast rising out of the earth or out of the land. Yeah, two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that the first beast out of the sea, the sea representing the nations, all throughout the Bible, sea represents the peoples, the, the many nations of the earth. The first beast is, is a political power. The second beast is a, spirit, a religious power. Looks like a lamb, but he speaks like a dragon. So it's a political power that looks, I mean, a, a spiritual power that looks godly, a religious power that looks godly, but sounds, wait a minute, you're echoing, you're echoing this political power. Oh, and by the way, tons of application in our day and in other times throughout history. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence, makes the land and its inhabitants worship the first beast. I'm just going to jump to the chase here. Is that the right phrase? And say, I would argue that the first beast is the Roman Empire and, if you want a personage to go with it, Nero the emperor of Rome. I would suggest that the second beast, the beast of the land, the religious beast, is the high priesthood of Israel and the high priest. The high priesthood of Israel was in league with Rome, not in league with the Messiah. The priesthood of Israel was the religious authority that hand in hand with the Roman authority brought about the death of Jesus and the persecution of the Christians. You remember the story of Paul before his conversion. He, he was a devout keeper of the law, thought he was serving God and was out arresting and perhaps even murdering Christians. So this second beast, the land beast, the beast of religion is in league with and to some extent even mimics the first beast. Forms great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. Verse 16, also it caused all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This is important. What is this mark of the beast? It's the name of the beast or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom, the writer says. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. Hey, you folk, I'm talking to you in code language. Let those of you that know what I'm talking about Calculate, figure it out, put together, add it up. The number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. And his number is 666. 
six, six. Bada bing, bada boom. Now, this is, this is fascinating to me. Social security card was proclaimed to be the mark of the beast when it first came out. Credit cards were going to be the mark of the beast. Every time some new piece of technology comes out that makes life a little bit easier, it suddenly is, oh, that's the mark of the beast. I'm not going to get that. I, I, would, I used to pastor, I, I was an associate pastor of a large Assemblies of God church in Sherman uh, back in the late 80s. And <laughs> we had, like, like any church, you know, we, it was a church of 1,600 people. We had a staff of 30 people. And there were computers. There were computers everywhere. We had computers. Pastor had a computer. I had a computer. There were five computers in the office, books, bookkeepers, secretaries. Everybody had a computer, right? We had this old preacher on staff. He was, he was the uh, senior citizen's pastor. And he was about 140 years old and had been a hardcore Assemblies of God Pentecostal all his life. And he refused to touch a computer. I don't mean to use a computer. I mean, he refused literally to touch a computer because that was the vehicle of the mark of the beast. And if we start using computers, we're given in and we're going to end up with the mark of the beast. And then it becomes this, uh, you know, you hear, you hear about, how do you say it? RFID or RDIF, whatever chips, Oh, that's, that's the mark of the beast. Every little bit of technology, people are like, ooh, that's the mark of the beast. It's just around the corner. It's coming any day. And you're not going to be able to buy or you're not going to be able to sell unless you've got that chip put in your head or put in your hand. I had a, I had a friend uh, years ago who used to say, you know, if they ever get around to giving you that chip that you can't buy or sell without it, take it in the hand and not in the head, because when you go to check out at the grocery store, it's a lot easier to do this than to do this. That's not what it's about. John says, it's the number of a man. It is the number of his name. And you can calculate it. You can figure it out. Now, I'm going to disclose to you who that man is and what that number means. But before I do, I want to back up about six chapters to Revelation chapter seven. And please listen to what I have to say here. Everybody gets all freaked out about the mark of the beast without realizing that it is a mimic of the mark of the lamb. Seven chapters before we have a mark of the beast, we have a mark of the lamb. Chapter seven, verse one. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth that no wind might blow on the earth or sea or against any tree. And then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun from the east with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and sea, say, the land and sea, say, do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Uh, we don't have time to go into this right now, but this is the mark of the lamb. This is the 
the, the, the ta, the, the letter T, the mark of the lamb in their foreheads. This is the baptismal seal. You get baptized, you get sealed. What do we say? And you are sealed in the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. This is the sign of the cross. This is the seal. This is the emerging new covenant. The old covenant is in league with Rome and is making you swear allegiance to Rome. And the number of their mark is the number of a man, the name of a man, which can be calculated. Okay. What I'm going to say next is a wee bit complicated. It's only going to take about two minutes to say it, but it's a wee bit complicated, so pay careful attention. In Greek, Nero's name is Neron Kaiser. Every time I say that, I think for those of you who know, to those of you with understanding, let the reader hear and understand, I think of Kaiser Soze. But uh, if you don't know Kaiser Soze, we'll talk about that another time. But Neron, N-E-R-O-N in Greek, Neron Kaiser. Nero Caesar. When you take the Greek title, move it over into Hebrew, add up the numbers, it is 666. That cannot be coincidence. I mean, Ronald Wilson Reagan had six letters in each of his name. And I knew people back in the day saying Reagan was the Antichrist. Henry Kissinger was the Antichrist. Obama was the Antichrist. This is not about the Antichrist. This is about the beast. And the number of his name is 666. Neron Kaiser, translated into Hebrew, the numbers add up to 666. You know how the numbers work. I know. A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, all, all the way forward. And, and you take the numbers of Ken and it adds up to a certain thing or, or Jim or Pat. You take Vicky and, and the numbers all, you know, the letters represent numbers and they add up. Nero's name and title adds up to 666. Now, here's what I think is mind-blowing. We discovered the oldest known manuscript of the book of Revelation. Back in, I don't remember, it was the late 70s or early 80s. I want to say 83, but I could be wrong. But we discovered the oldest known manuscript of the book of Revelation. And lo and behold, it doesn't say 666. It says 616. And if you will look at any of your modern day Bibles like this uh, ESV, the footnote, some manuscripts 616. So which is it, 666 or 616? And I'm going to suggest you, yes, it's both. In Greek to Hebrew, Neron Kaiser is 666. What were the three languages of the Jewish world? Greek, Hebrew, or Aramaic? And Latin. Those were the three languages above the cross. Watch this. Neron Kaiser. 
Greek to Hebrew. The numbers add up to 666. Nero Kaiser, Latin, transliterated into Hebrew. Dang it, the numbers add up to 616. Whoever is copying the manuscript knows who this is referring to, knows who their readers are, and translates it like we translate in idioms that we understand, translates so the reader that is reading it understands this is not some 21st century bad, scary guy. This is Nero, the emperor of Rome, with whom the religious leadership in Israel is in league. That's chapter 13 of the book of Revelation. I'm going to jump forward and then I'm finished. Three chapters later, you have something called the Whore of Babylon. And oh my goodness, as a child, I was taught the Roman Catholic Church is the Whore of Babylon. No. Here, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, you can read it on your own. I'm just going to tell you a story real quickly. The whore of Babylon, the prostitute of Babylon, is an entity that sells herself to the nations of the world. In the story, she rides on the back of the beast. If the beast is Nero and the Roman Empire, the city of seven hills, the book of Revelation literally says in chapter 16, the beast is also seven, the, the seven heads represent seven hills. Rome is the city of seven hills. Watch, watch. This woman who prostitutes herself sits on the back of the beast. This woman, I would argue, is apostate Judaism, is the religious system of Israel, is the bride of God who said, no, I'm running off with somebody else. She is supported by the beast. She is held up by the beast. She rides on the back of the beast. This is Israel in league with Rome. But in chapter 16, the beast turns and devours her. The one that she thought she was in league with, in bed with, supported by, turns and devours her. That's exactly what happened in AD 70. Rome turned and devoured Jerusalem, Israel, the old covenant structures, the temple, the law, the priesthood. Rome turned and devoured it. And when Rome got done, there was nothing left but bones. That's what the book of Revelation is about. That's who the beast is. That's what the mark of the beast is. And so we may be able to apply some of these things to various situations throughout history, including various situations in our own lifetime. But what the text is about is first century dealings. So don't worry about getting a tattoo that somehow that's going to be the mark of the beast or getting uh, a chip. You know, get, get your dog that chip, but don't you dare take it because they can find your dog, but it's the mark of the beast if you take it. No, it's not. No, it's not. The mark of the beast is, if you want to spiritualize it, it's selling your soul to the powers that be, but those powers are going to end up eating you alive. So there you go. That's all I have to say about that. Any comments or questions? I do have a, a couple of questions. Uh, when, when it talks about the mark of the beast, 
on the forehead and the hand. Is that kind of the same reference as the Hebrew, the phylacteries, the, 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 with a back in Exodus, it talks about a God's law on your on your forehead and on your hand. That, is that, that a parallel? That has been that has been suggested, and that makes good sense. Also, someone else has a lot of other people have said uh, it's about your, your your mind and your actions, your mind and, and, and what you do. Um, right. That's what it means back in the heat. In exactly. Exodus, right. But they exactly. they and they went literal on that too, and did the phylacteries, right? right? So right. they basically right. did the same thing that 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 uh, uh, the John Van Empey does, right? They went literal yeah. and, and turned it into something crazy. <laughs> I didn't so, know. I didn't know he did that. Well, not, not with that, but I mean, you know, John Van Empey oh, takes everything literally in in in, uh, yeah. in Revelations and then turns yeah. it into something that's just absolutely <laughs> insane. Yeah. So when it says you can't buy or sell, so that just means if you're not, if you give yourself to the the system, the Roman system, and 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 deny Christ, uh, and and deny Christ, so that you can, uh, you know, because they'll they'll persecute you otherwise. That means that if you don't do that, that the, the not being able to buy and sell was simply the persecution of the Christians that they weren't able to. Yeah, and, do business and, and stuff and, like that. And there, and there was also yes, yes, to what you just said. But there was also literally, literally. Oh, I'm not finished. I thought I was finished. There is also literally a mark that was given under Nero, saying that you had pledged allegiance to him, and therefore were allowed to conduct business in the Roman Empire. That literally happened. But another crazy thing, oh my gosh, I'm glad, I, I'm, you, I'm glad you reminded me of this. Nero, if, if you don't know anything about Nero, let me encourage every one of you to take 15 or 20 minutes and just Google Nero and read two or three different articles about him. Nero, Nero became emperor when he was 16 years old. He murdered his first wife after accusing her of adultery. He married again, murdered his second wife, kicked her to death while she was pregnant. So murdered his second wife and child. And then found a young male slave who reminded him of his wife had him castrated and married him, dressed him in the queen's royal attire and led him through the streets, made people pay homage to him. Murdered his mother, murdered his stepbrother, murdered Seneca, the philosopher who had been his instructor as a child. What I'm about to tell you is horrible, but true. Where the Vatican is right now, on the same spot, was the circus of Nero. Circus not being like Ferris wheels, but a circuit. It's where horse races were held. Nero soaked Christians in tar, tied them to poles, and lit them to provide light for his nighttime races. That's the original Roman candle. 